Joining us now is a scientist, author, speaker who has dedicated his career to understanding human performance and how the human body responds to extreme conditions. Dr. Greg Wells, welcome to What She Said. Again, it's our pleasure. Yeah, it's so good <laughs> to be back with you again. So fun. Your book is called Ripple Effect. What ripple effect are we talking about? So it's the ripple effect between different things that we can do to improve our health. And I kind of discovered this by accident a few years ago. Uh, I actually got a heart infection, a little virus, and it was because I was run down. And when I was in the hospital, I was re researching how to get better as fast as I could. And it, I discovered that even though I wanted to be better physically, the foundation of that was sleep. And then I started looking into sleep and realizing <laughs> that if you sleep better, actually it changes the hormones that control your appetite. And then if you eat better, it actually improves your body faster and gets rid of inflammation. So there, there are all these little things that trickle. And I think often we go after one thing and don't realize how everything's interconnected. So that's what I try to explain. Well, okay, no because I'm, hang on, because I'm a co-host <laughs> of this show. I'm putting my hand up right here. Nice. Did you examine menopause and how it affects women? Because since I hit menopause, I have not slept. I am putting on weight. I am stressed. And I think it's all down to sleep. But unless I take drugs, I'm not going to sleep. Yeah, it's not. Uh, it's one of the big challenges that we're faced with, and many that were. It's funny you mention that because this actually started my career twenty years ago. Was that's one of the questions I got. Well, what about? I was trying to teach people how to be healthy, and one of the women put up her hand and said, "Young man, what do you know about menopause?" And so <laughs> it's been an ongoing uh, investigation ever since then. And and my mom actually went through some challenges during menopause, and the only way she could deal with it was exercise and nutrition because she couldn't take hormone replacement therapy. So mm -hmm. uh, I would actually suggest that. It's okay to take drugs, and if your doc wants to do that, that's fine. But there's a number of different things that you can do. Water will tremendously help with hot flashes, getting really hydrated. Exercising and different types of exercise will actually help you to control percent body fat. Don't worry about weight, by the way, because muscle weighs more than fat. You can get healthier and fitter and leaner, even yeah, though you might actually gain more. weight. <laughs> I, I keep on giving muscle the credit. Yeah. So, so what exercise specifically are you talking about? I mean, the goal here is to get Kate sleeping. Right. So we're going to get her drinking <laughs> yep. water. Yep, start right? drinking water for okay. sure. So she can't go anywhere where she isn't five minutes away from a bathroom. Yep. Okay, that's one. That's all good. <laughs> Number two, exercise. But what kind? Because she does exercise. She walks. She she does. Uh, she works with a Wait, trainer. A so what? Times a week, what yeah. kind of? For if you're doing work with a trainer right now, that's mm -hmm. fantastic. I love people to develop muscle mass. And if you develop muscle mass by lifting some great weights and doing whole body exercises and working hard enough that you can't talk to your trainer while you're training. That's a key well, factor. Can I yell at her? Because I do that and <laughs> right, say, good. why am I paying you for this Exactly. A lot? <laughs> That's awesome. Um, cardio like, intervals are fantastic. Walking is amazing, but getting some intervals in there where you actually produce some speed lactic acid, yeah. some speed work is fantastic. It's a little bit more intense than we might normally look at, but you know, we can actually push off aging. I think the concept of living to 120 in a healthy way is not unreasonable for humans. If we eat right, if we if we actually train, uh, if we focus on and give ourselves permission to sleep enough, get blackout blinds, all sorts of little things add up. Okay, well, just to go back to Kate's sleeping, she's doing the exercise thing. She's going to be doing the drinking thing. Yeah. So now what? Oh, yeah. Because she's not sleeping. She's yeah. sending emails at four in the morning. And I'm on I'm on HRT. Right. So I'm 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 still getting. You know, I get one, it's more of a night sweat than a hot flash yeah. around 4.30 in the morning. Right. It's bad, then I'm awake. That's Do you find it. when you wake up with that, that your mind's racing as well? Absolutely. So here's a that's magical little... That's why I'm little... sending emails. <laughs> exactly. As soon as you said someone sending emails at four o'clock in the morning, that's a huge sort of flag, red flag for me. Uh, what we need you to try to do is to defend the last hour before you go to sleep. And what I mean by that is mm -hmm. eliminating, like no looking at your devices, no email, read fiction, take a hot bath, uh, meditate, stretch. We need to protect that last hour because I find often with people who wake up at 2.30 in the morning, <laughs> mind is racing, it's as a result of what was happening in the hour before sleep mm -hmm. because that's when your creativity comes into play. That's when problem solving comes into mm -hmm. play, not in the first half of sleep, the second half. And so if we defend that last hour and set the stage for being really calm and really relaxed, it so can it, really make a difference. It's true that the, because there was a post on Facebook the other day. Eric Alper posted it. Good morning, everyone that's up at 3 a.m. You are the creative people. Yes, absolutely. So the first half of sleep has to do with learning. That's when we process the information from the day. That's when new connections are made within the brain. The second half of sleep 
is when the brain works on creativity and problem solving. It's fantastic. If you've got a problem in your life that you want to solve, journal about it in the hour before you go to sleep. Your brain will work on it and you might actually wake mm -hmm. up with a solution. The problem is, is that we work. We're checking email. We're checking social. We're firing off text messages. We're on our devices. And that gets the brain racing through all the problems of the day, which you wake up thinking about. So that's why I tell people, please defend that last hour before sleep. I don't send too many world-class emails at 11 o'clock at night. I know I don't send good emails at 4 o'clock in the morning. So Should we talk about we Donald Trump's Twitter feed? <laughs> that's a perfect example, actually. We won't get into that. But that is a perfect example of when not to send tweets. Yeah. Well, I never realized that sleep really, uh, which most people I know talk about in one way or another that they have issues with, is then has that ripple effect on on, mm -hmm. on your hormones and your appetite and, and how you feel, your mood, I guess? Absolutely. So one of the things I discovered when I was doing all my research on sleep was that when we sleep, we release a hormone called growth hormone. Growth hormone circulates throughout your body. It repairs muscle. It repairs bone. It repairs skin. It's the fountain of youth. If people want to feel younger prioritize sleep and get a great night's sleep. Some other hormones are changed as well when we sleep. Leptin and ghrelin are regulated. Those are the hormones that control your appetite and how full you feel when you eat. So if you actually want to follow healthier eating during the day, you need to sleep well because unless you sleep well, you cannot make good decisions during the day. It's impossible. Your brain doesn't function that way. So it's for me the foundation of absolutely everything. Okay. So, so what do we, it's, a big change for a lot of people, but you say little changes can help. What should people who are not sleeping? And, and what do you consider a good range of sleep? Is five hours enough? Is six hours enough? <laughs> yeah. So how much sleep do we actually need? The research is quite clear. Any less than six hours, you increase your risk of all-cause mortality. That's sort of uh, death as a result of anything, cancer, heart disease, type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, anything. So we're looking for a bare minimum of six hours. In a row? Or can, ideally, I, can I make it up well, in a nap? It's interesting. Like, it, ideally in a row, but there's also great research that says that napping's fantastic. A 20-minute power nap improves mental performance. A 90-minute full complete nap is also wonderful for your body and for your mind, which no question. Sometimes people wake up uh, from naps feeling horrible, so it's that's why I say 20 minutes or 90 minutes. Either set an alarm, wake up in 20 minutes, or allow yourself to wake up naturally. That typically happens 75 to 90 minutes later. If you want to live the longest possible time, the research is quite clear. You need seven to eight hours. That's five complete sleep cycles. And if you have to take a nap to get to that number, that's all good. You, you have steps in your book. So sleep is, is the foundation. And then exercise? Yeah, sleep, eat, move, think are the four components that I really tried to focus on. Okay. So sleeping is the foundation and then starting to exercise. And I just like people to move. The benefits of exercise are so powerful that is, as little as 15 minutes of, of walking, which isn't that hard, is enough to decrease your risk of certain cancers 24 to 40%. That's incredible information that says you don't really need to do much. doesn't need to be that hard. Anything helps. And the more that you can build movement into your life, the better. And what about think? That's the third step. Yeah, that was one that really sort of came out as I began to look into this. The power of mindfulness, the power of meditation, the power of positive thinking, the power of focus were all elements that I think really enable people to go from living a life where we struggle and we just barely get through our days to where we actually have energy, where we're actually calm, where we're really directed into the things that we're most passionate about, where we can respond to situations rather than reacting to situations. Probably over the last eight to nine months, I've been all in on mindfulness and meditation, and it's completely revolutionizing my life. And I'd encourage people to explore that with apps like Headspace or Calm. There's some great ways of learning it, and I think it'll totally change people's lives. So where can we get this book or when can we get this book? It comes out on April 4th. You can get it Ooh, anywhere, so which just is a, uh, pretty a exciting. A couple, couple more days. It only took two years to write. So this has been a big, big, long moment coming. And, uh, you know, Amazon and all the retailers will have it. And uh, if anyone wants to check it out, you can get it through my website too, drgregwells.com. Anything that surprised you? The biggest thing that surprised me was how when we add up little tiny things, it turns into compound interest for the body. We always uh -huh. go after massive change, but it's not like that. Little tiny changes over an extended period of time make a massive difference. Don't worry about revolutionizing your life. Just do little tiny things. It'll add up and you won't recognize yourself for Do the better. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Greg Wells, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on your show. This is what she said. Stay with us.